Hello friends and welcome to a special episode on Behind the Trowel. I'm your host Natasha Bilson. Today we're with the archaeologists on and off screen of the Great British Dig episode four where we venture to Trowel Point in South Shields. Hello everybody, how are you? Hello. Um, Hi. Hi. So I think what we'll do as we do every week is have a quick introduction to everybody on the panel today. So Chloe, please give a quick introduction to yourself. Hello, I'm Chloe Duckworth. I'm one of the archaeologists on the screen on the Great British Dig, and I'm a lecturer at Newcastle University. Brilliant. Uh, Jim? Uh, I'm Jim Brightman. I've been a behind-the-scenes archaeologist on all four episodes of the Great British Dig, but on this last episode I was also an on-screen survey expert at Dig HQ. Brilliant. Chris? Uh, my name's Chris Scott. I'm one of the partners at Solstice Heritage, along with Jim. Um, we supported all, a lot of the development of the series in terms of the sites, and, and also we did a lot of the um, off-screen archaeological work. And um, for Trow Point, I was the archaeological site supervisor. Awesome. Ellie? Hi everyone, my name is Ellie. Of course, you, you can read it, it's much longer, but call me Ellie. Anyway, uh, I was one of the uh, behind the scenes archeologists uh, for this episode. I used to be a commercial archeologist, but now I'm undertaking my PhD at Newcastle University under the guidance of Dr. <laughs> Chloe Duckworth. Brilliant, Claire. Hi, um, I'm Claire Henderson and I did the behind the scenes archaeology on four of the episodes of the Great British Dig and outside of that I currently work freelance in Heritage. Awesome, and Don. Hello, I'm Don O'Mara. I was the environmental specialist at Trout Point. Um, my normal day job is as a science advisor with Historic England, uh, but previously I worked in commercial archaeology and coincidentally I worked with Ellie several years ago. It's kind of the beauty of archaeology, you know, how we yeah. always cross paths. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The Literally beauty and the curse. Yeah, it is exactly. a beauty and a curse, yeah. <laughs> and for our viewers, my name is Natasha Bilson. I'm a commercial field archaeologist based in London, but with the job, you travel all over the UK. You literally go where the project is. So that's me, and I was one of the lead archaeologists on the show with Chloe. So how was everyone's thoughts on the show? I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I loved the music, but the music like kept me going. I was like enjoying myself, like just on that journey, me with the mallet at the beginning. Yeah. I was worried about that edit, I'm not gonna lie. I was worried they're gonna see me like trying to hammer in these flags <laughs> and epically fail. <laughs> I think that's probably the reason why you didn't see it on camera. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. Honestly, um, yeah, put it this way, everybody was laughing at me when I was trying to do that because <laughs> I just couldn't. I don't know what was happening. The flags were too tall. I think it was like <laughs> eye level with me. So yeah. I'm trying to hammer them in. <laughs> I'm like, it's just literally eye level. I, I couldn't, I couldn't like work out, you know, exactly how to, to knock it down. So yeah, it, it was awful to watch. So yeah, I mean, that'd be a great blooper. Yeah. <laughs> I think what did make it in a little bit was me being quite grumpy and irritable with Richard when we so we were we were pegging out a trench together um, and it's that thing of when you, you're doing a bit of triangulation um, mental triangulation in the field um, and he misunderstood what I said and he went another way and I think all you get on the show is just me going just put the peg in or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think scenically you know? it was lovely, it was good, mm. even though yeah. they didn't really capture that for a few days, it was really grim. It was maybe, was it maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, that the weather was dread, like, it, yeah, it was dreadful, but yeah, it, 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 it looked very nice in the final edit. Do you think, because my I thought watching it that uh, I'd forgotten how much time we spent in wet weather gear because it, it felt like it, it just looked like it rained and was howling wind the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the sun on that site. I think was it the first day or that one morning and that was the last, it. The last day was quite nice, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, we had a good end yeah. to it. It's like the, yeah. Yeah, the final afternoon. It was really pleasant. I think 
when the drone shot came when the drone came over doing all those big scenic shots yeah, up and down the good. coast, it was lovely weather for about two hours. Yeah. And that, that's all of those shots. <laughs> well, we couldn't afford to order it for the whole thing, so we just did it for when we had the drone. Yeah. I just sort of ordered a bit of decent weather. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. There was, a, there was sea spray coming up constantly, yeah. wasn't there, into everyone's faces, especially, Claire, where you were, yeah. um, which on the show <laughs> looks like I did it on my own, but I think there's one bit where you can see your back working um, at least once or twice, but I think where you were, it was really rough, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it was coming up in sort of custard pie-sized lumps, <laughs> and I was just waiting for the moment that, you know, like a 1950s comedy splat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if I remember correctly, because you were literally by the cliff. It was mm. you, Frankie, Golf. You guys were literally by the cliff. And I yeah. remember every time I'd go there, just the, the wind. Yeah. I don't know how many miles per hour? I think, Chloe, if I remember correctly, you actually said how many miles per hour the wind was. I've actually forgotten. I remember you I'm sure I, I would have looked it up. and I, it, I think it was 987 at one point. <laughs> <laughs> So what was your, okay, talking about the sea foam or the sea froth, um, what was your most memorable parts on the dig? It's okay if it didn't make the show. Um, what can you, what was the most memorable parts? For anyone? Me too, I think. I think I enjoyed the standing down at the, um, at the sea, talking to Hugh about coastal erosion. That was, that was good. That was quite memorable. There's a good, there's a good um, photo of me taken by one of the crew and it looks like I'm kind of ranting or I'm looking for people to join a crew to hunt a, a whale that killed my friends or something but it was uh, <laughs> uh, it was good that that was one of the days when it was quite stormy so the, the waves behind us were quite dramatic so it was a good um, it was a good day to talk about something like coastal erosion but um, um, I also did get a, a very uh, happy message from my mother who I was glad I was wearing a big coat so, <laughs> our takeaway thing for the whole episode was that um, I think you wore a big coat. I'm glad to see that. Yes, thanks, Mum. I am I'm in my 30s. I can't take care of myself. So, um, that was good. I think, admit, yeah, sorry, Anne. Oh, no, no, no worries. I think my most memorable, memorable moment is when I was um, digging down the weapons pit. Every day, of course, there would be locals coming up to see what was going on. And there was this lady saying, oh, you're digging this. Um, that's what we used to call when I was younger. Uh, when I was a child, I used to come and play here. And we used to call this the poo hole. Yeah. Because, uh, we'd find loads of dog poos in here. <laughs> and I was so pleased to hear that. And of course, I, everything was already de deterred and I was way further down. But you still think, oh. Yeah. Well, there's a very, very rich organic layer at the top of the yeah. isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> With a distinct smell. Don't smell. Yeah. So, yeah, that was quite memorable. Yeah. And, Jim, how about your, your bit? How about uh, your bit on camera? How was that? It was, it was really good. It was, it was very brief. Um, I don't say that because I'm like, I'm bitter or something. <laughs> like, uh, why, why didn't they have more? No, it was, it was, we'd, we'd said right at the outset, because as Chris said, we were kind of, um, we were involved in the early stages. So in the planning, looking for sites, the re initial research and Trout Point is a site that Chris has known about and had a real sort of personal interest in for years, decades, possibly. Um, so when we'd, we'd suggested this and one of the things we should say, it's, it, it's, referenced in the program but it's it's owned by the national trust um the site um and one of the things we thought would be of huge benefit was to do a full earthwork survey because no one really knew what the extent of everything was what was actually going on up there so we do we'd pitched it to the production company when we looked like we were going to do trap points said well we really need to do this we need a surveyor to do it um and they said oh well can one of you do it and so well yeah i can um, they're like, oh, great, right? You're going on camera then because we need an eight, we need the survey experts. I was like, oh, okay then. Um, but actually, when it came down to it, in the end, I, they that wasn't staged. The stuff I was genuinely doing that bit of survey work anyway. When Hugh and Richard came to talk to me, so it it was like ten minutes out of a full day of survey work, um, and that was that. And then then I needed to go down and 
look at old maps on the computer so that I could have a chat with you. And so my experience was just like a normal archaeologist, like on the other ones, the other episodes, really just occasionally someone stuck a camera in front of me. Um, and uh, I've had some very nice feedback, mainly from my mother who says I looked lovely on camera. So, there we go. It was a beautiful moment where you're sitting in, in Dig HQ and Hugh's chatting to you and you sort of look up at him and flutter your eyelashes. Jim, which <laughs> I really enjoyed. Um. <laughs> it was entirely involuntary. And I mean, uh, we've all spent a little bit of time in close proximity to Hugh on these programmes. And I, I, I think that all of us would have done that or have done yeah. that. <laughs> I was just unfortunate enough to have it caught on camera and a <laughs> gift by Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I had to I had to have my revenge for the gift that was made of me. Um, yeah, although right. it wasn't you that did that. No, so you're really you're just paying forward the, yeah. uh... <laughs> the chain reaction. Yeah, I thought you know the survey stuff. I really enjoyed um, this episode because I I felt that it it covered a lot of things. You know, I, I was quite sort of complainy in the last live stream about some of the elements of the previous episode. Just kind of being concerned as an archaeologist that you know about how things come across and I thought watching this episode I thought we've got survey in here we're explaining how that ties in there are a few bits where we're explaining stratigraphy um there's one bit where you know we don't really find anything and that's answering a question as well and I felt like it, it really did get across a lot of the more archaeological side of things yeah. as well as the community which of course it's also you know 50 percent about the community i don't know if other people felt that but i, I really enjoyed this show this episode yeah, yeah, yeah. very much so yeah, yeah definitely and even in the comments now by the way if this is your first time um watching the live live stream with us you can actually write questions comments and we'll be able to read and answer them as we're going along and even now delby even said he goes what a fantastic episode wednesday was and yeah, we want more gym time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll screenshot that. We'll yeah. screenshot that and send it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Email that straight to Channel Four. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the people have spoken. <laughs> Brilliant. Might just be asking for the gyms to reopen, though. You know, <laughs> yeah, by any means you can. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. We even had a comment here from Nigel Sadler. Thank you for your comment, Nigel. Hello team, South Shields was the best yet, being straightforward and less fanciful than the garden digs. The survey work certainly added to the programme. Great. Jim's like, yes, that's all me. Yes, yes, <laughs> I, yes, I believe that's another compliment for me, yes, yes. And another tenor in the post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm really glad, I'm really glad that it sort of resonated because it is such a key part of the archaeological process, um, particularly on a site like that that's just defined by really really complex earthworks it's it was really nice to that we were able to get it into there as, as such a prominent part of the uh, the story mm. so I'm, that's i'm really pleased mm. yeah i think it is my favorite one i need to watch them all again i feel yeah. watch it again yeah. like in a week's time when everything's smoothed down and there's no more like anticipation to watch it on the night <laughs> live tweeting live chatting you know messaging with you guys and then i think yeah, take a step back, watch it again. And what can we do better, right? What can we yeah. constructively do better? Um, hopefully we get more control. If there is a second series, we can get more control. <laughs> what's going on, maybe? Like, get some more, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Under the power go to Chris's head. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what it was about this episode. Was it the, was it the nature of the archaeology made it quite, in some ways, having quite, um, I don't want to say simple archaeology but having um, a really tightly defined question and having a site that we had a good historical background so you can approach it with really kind of tight questions um, mm -hmm. and things like like um, um, very specialisms for, for, from, for the survey for the mapping bringing the history it was a good mix I, I don't know I, I'm, I can't really put my finger on because the archaeology at the other all the other sites was also very interesting but I think Child Point was as the kind of it was quite a it was an e it was easy to mentally think of the area we were digging because it was that one promontory um the history is quite tight so yeah it, it did work quite well yeah i i think there were, there were lots of things that, that worked 
for this site. I think obviously we've said it every time on this, um, following all the episodes, but obviously the programme leans on the work of others every week. Yeah. Um, and for this site, there has been pr- some previous work. Um, Richard, I think, mentions that it's never been archaeologically excavated, which is true. Um, but it has certainly been looked at from a from a survey point of view, from a very um, a very sort of high level point of view. So it, yeah. it the program leans on that um, in terms of, and our planning lent on that work particularly um, in terms of thinking about the questions that we had. Yeah. Um, I think in, there's obviously a bit of it as well that where the planning is directed by the threat to that site. So that pushed us in certain areas from uh, the threat from coastal erosion, um, which is really, really strong driver for the planning that we did. But also I think that comes across and it, and it directed the questions that we, mm. that we were looking at. Um, I think equally, the, the other thing is, is the earthworks as well. I think, you know, sort of um, the, the ability to sort of start off from a, a point of view of being able to see the see the feature from minute one, as a, as an earthwork it was really really strong and yeah. and gave the program some great direction. And I think, obviously, equally with the trench that Chloe and Richard set out so happily. Um, the um, <laughs> oh Richard, with, oh, I'm sorry, sorry Richard, if you're watching um, this. <laughs> but uh, with that one, obviously, what helped there was the archaeology poking out of the ground already, I suppose. <laughs> so. That, that was really good. But I think it, from those points of view, you know, you know, the really, really strong sort of drivers from for the story and, and also really direct archaeological questions that we were trying to, trying to answer. I think um, one of the things that also struck me when we're doing the one at Trial Point is that the nature of the archaeology and the, the present landscape in which it exists are quite relatable so even if you're not an archaeologist you can imagine standing up on that headland looking out to sea and perceiving an incoming threat um but you can imagine it coming from behind as well the way that we were trying to to sort of describe and I know one of the things that struck me was we were excavating a defensive site in a sense when we did Benwell but you stand in the middle of a housing estate in Newcastle and it's hard to imagine a fort and you know why that might feel like a threatened position but I think there was a real atmosphere to the dig at trail point, which I imagine if you work in television meant that you perhaps the story resonated um, more deeply or um, with more sort of in a more relatable way than some of the other sites. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. I think yeah. that, um, I know. without, <laughs> it's really hard for me to say that Claire, but um, <laughs> uh, it's a really, really good point. Cause that, I think obviously the thing about working in back gardens on the other episodes is that that landscape context is a lot harder to articulate. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think when you're surrounded by fences and garden domes and pick plastic yeah. flamingos, it's quite hard to sort of put that across, I think. Um, yeah. Whereas there, the landscape context hasn't changed that much, mm-hmm. and is uh, and is very much the context in which that site was created. Yeah, so. I think. I think I'm... Sorry, go no, Ellie, please. No, to chime in a bit with what Claire was saying, maybe it's from a different angle, but also for the locals, for the people who live there, this is a shared space. And a lot of people, you can't see this obviously on the on the footage that um, came out completely uh, that was released in the episode. But load of loads of people came came up to me and said, "Oh yeah, I used to play here as a yeah. kid." Or like, um, I don't know, my great grandparents have always lived here. I remember this place. I've always been here. So it's part of the community. So it tells a story. That's the story of that community. Um, which obviously, if you if you're digging, uh, I don't know, in back gardens or um, a graveyard site, which is in back gardens, it's not the same. This there's a, there's a connection with history that's still there. Yeah, okay. and I think and they were and they're able to contribute things as well. Whereas you know nobody living in Benwell today can tell us anything about what 
it was like living there yeah. in rural because they're not that old. Yeah. Whereas in South Shields, you know, a lot of them, even if it was handed down from um, an older relative, about like like Chris, I'm sure he's dying to tell the story about, you know, getting taken to play amongst the asbestos or whatever it was he yeah. did as a kid in South Shield. Um, <laughs> you know, they can actually feel that they're just stopping by, asking what we're doing, but then they're able to yeah. give something back. So there was a nice sort of, um, sort of two-way street of information at trial point that you didn't necessarily get at the other sites that we were yeah. yeah and I think that's you know I think part of this um, I, I think definitely you know the landscape side of things but when we're talking about digging in people's gardens one of the one of the big constraints was the fact that we were filming during the pandemic and therefore we had to observe social distancing so um I think it, because that was very open site, it was a lot easier for various people to kind of pop by. Whereas the real, the real tragedy of doing the garden digs in that period is that, you know, neighbors couldn't be popping into each other's garden so much. There was just, it was just less opportunity for that. And it's a real shame. And yeah. I, think, I, I think it would be nice if we can continue to do some things in gardens. Mm. Um, but I think also maybe, you know, some, most community archaeology isn't going to be taking place in people's gardens, so um, there's no harm in showing both sides of it. I think. I think it's a real, it's a real nice mix having the gardens and then community spaces. And again, going back to planning, it was one of the reasons we pushed trow points quite hard as an option for this first series, because we felt that it it gave that interesting uh, contrast of garden archaeology to public space to shared. Com- community space archaeology as sort of like a one-off a special as it were within the overall story of the series and really I think we're really pleased that it it kind of seemed to have resonated in that way that we'd hoped it would which is great yeah no, I think that that's a really good point as well because we, we um it is you know Ellie talking about uh people visiting the site and contributing and things like that is is great because um I think you see a bit of that on the program and I think, and we saw a huge amount of it on site, and it's and and that was brilliant. And it's lovely that 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 came across. I think in terms of our experience and the program, because actually one of the reasons we really wanted to do it was was that that people, everyone in South Shields uses that space. Um, it is a it is a real community space that everybody really really values. So to be able to kind of for the program, I think to reflect a bit of that was was brilliant. Yeah. I'm I'm certainly really pleased as someone from that community that it that it it saw that it, that you saw that in the program. I do wonder as well. Maybe it's because of the type of archaeology that we're dealing with and the history itself. It is a military site, so I do wonder if that element as well added to the enjoyment of the viewer. Because if you look at the the history of documentaries on TV, there is a large focus on military history, military expeditions and things like that. So battlefield archaeology is very popular and a lot of people can kind of relate to it because obviously it's so close in history. It's a generation ago. You know, there's a lot of oral histories that are still there and a lot of documentation. So I do wonder if it's one of that factors into the enjoyment for the public. I wonder. I I think so. I think I think it's that the fact it is so close in historical terms that I think people feel uh, feel an ownership of, of that history, feel an ability to relate to it because it's part of a sort of family family experience that they have heard about, know about, or, um, and have personal connections to. So I think actually it's 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 personal connection and that ability that people feel very able to to sort of access it and, and feel that they understand it mm. Mm. definitely and even here comment from nigel again thank you nigel military or industrial archaeology is a really good way of involving a community as usually the finds can connect with living memory yeah it's one of those things isn't it like when you get those glass bottles uh, uh is it cobble neck I always forget the name the ones with the marble inside the neck mm-hmm. people love them and even stone marbles they love it because they know exactly what that is yeah this is what i tell um tell people a lot actually you know when we come to looking at things like typology which is the way that archaeologists can you know you can find a fragment of something and work out 
which type of pot it came from. So the Romans, for example, are mass producing things to a kind of model. Um, but we all, we all have that innate gift for typology. It's just that we tend to apply it to the world around us now. So, you know, it's the same thing as knowing that something looks like it's from the 70s or the 80s or whatever. Um, and I guess that makes of people, when you're looking at more recent archeology, span it makes of everybody a bit of an expert because we've all got our own kind of, our own understanding of, of the objects around us and how they relate to us in terms of time period and also in terms of use and function. And it's one of the really interesting things when you're doing work with members of the community that, you know, we've talked about before, but the way that people can actually contribute to, um, to our knowledge as well. Um, and, you know, when we were in Nottingham, it was like people who were involved in local history. And here it's people who were used to the military or who have spent yeah. their whole lives looking at military history or simply just, you know, have uh, lived through or had parents who lived through the war, uh, the, the Second World War. So, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, it was really good having the uh, the guys from the 101st Regiment as well helping out. And um, it was great, great that we had that space to use where we could set up the tent. But they were, um, all the guys, they were they were all really nice. And um, yeah, it was, it was good to get their their input as well. Um, even just to see that, to, when, to see them come down to site and, and to look at features that that, that they obviously a very, very different period. But there is that connection to, to think that, hundred years ago, guys just like them would have been uh, practicing in those trenches and um, uh, up on tripoint points um, stationed just like they were in the, in the barracks close. Yeah. So yeah, that was it was nice as well to uh, to have kind of their modern counterparts um, present. So yeah, it was, it was good. That's, that that's really worth worth saying as well. That uh, Don's right. That actually, there was the the guys from the regiment were actually super helpful in terms of um actually helping us to interpret some of the the actual military installations on on the headland there so it's because they many they're thinking about many of the same things in yeah. their work today that um that were concerns in terms of creating gun, those gun emplacements um that we looked at and stuff like that on the headland you know it was the same stuff the same issues same things to think about and obviously we we're, we're never going to be as expert as those guys are yeah. I mean, archaeology is one big teamwork isn't it it's not it's not the, the myth of archaeology the great enduring myth of archaeology in in film is that it's this you know individual who kind of goes out on their own and does things um and you know Indiana Jones you show him any tablet in any language and he, he sort of tells yeah. you what it is and, and it's not how archaeology is at all and, and that's why I'm really happy that you know Tash has organized these live streams because it gives everyone a chance to see how many people go into into it and when, when we think about all the specialists that are involved afterwards as well as during the digs you know it's it's huge and uh and that's the that's the thing you know it's, it's about knowing when you know something and when to ask somebody else and, and, and work with them as well. It's great. So it's the nicest thing about it, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, because I think I think one of the things that um, always strikes you as an archaeologist is in some ways that the best archaeologists are the ones who know what they don't know and don't then just try and fill in all the gaps themselves and are quite comfortable saying, um, actually that's not my specialism because mm -hmm. however you perceive archaeology it is a very sort of um, broad church and there are a lot of people who you would simply pass that on to because it's it's what they do and I think I, it, I've always felt like a, a disappointment when people find out you're an archaeologist because they will invariably ask you about something that you know nothing about and so you're left <laughs> kind of going you'll know that site that they're digging on, you know, and you're thinking, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> that does also sound like a big load of excuses for being <laughs> an archaeologist, and it's very much that as well, you know. It's, no, it's the mark of a true expert, being able to say, I don't know, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say as well, we should also shout out uh, Breaking Ground and Operation Life Scale in general, both amazing organisations that kind of partner with each other, um, who also 
were able to to work on the show on and off camera. Um, it was fantastic seeing them again. I personally worked yeah. with them them back in 2013. So for me, it was I was like, yes. Now it feels like even more like really cool to have more members, you know, who are so yeah. keen to work in it. Um, have you worked with them before, Don? No. Um, so yeah, that was the first time I met the guys from, from Breaking Ground. Uh, so yeah, it was really nice to meet them and, and to talk about. Um, they've been doing work on a whole range of, of different sites. Um, and it, so I, it's it's a, an organization you, you hear about and every now and again, you'll read a, an article about, but um, yeah, I, it was really good to, to see the guys. Um, I think they, they were kind of themselves disappointed that a lot of their projects in, in 2020 had been of course shut down because of pandemic. So I think they were really glad that they could, um, because of that slight easing and lockdown, they could come up uh, and especially to come up and work on a military site. I think they were really keen. So it was, um, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was great to see them for the first time and, and kind of put, put names to faces and things. So, um, it was good. And again, it, it's always interesting to see someone with a much more tangible link to the archeology span than, than what you have. So, um, I think that's always, it, it's the same thing when you work in industrial sites and, and you, you meet someone who also worked in that industry and they, um, they just have a very different way of looking at the, the remains. Um, and even the, the way they talk about the, the archeology, span it's, it's with far more of a um, kind of a, a tangible link to it. Even if it's, if it's a military site that could be 200 years old, a site that they would of course never have been on, but still they've got that kind of connection. So if, if you speak to, mm-hmm. A metal worker and you're on a, a, a blast furnace site they'll just they'll just be thinking about it in a very different way and that's that's always good as well and I suppose when we're all professional archaeologists we're kind of you 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 forget how much there's a lot of kind of group think as well and and you you interpret things because it's kind of it's just the way kind of you're you're taught to think about things but to have someone with that that extra expertise and that different uh, life experience was yeah really good mm. it's really interesting that um i just not not actually in terms of the show but in terms of the research that i do um you know we find so many times that when when we're looking at how people made glass in the past and, and the industrial or you know artisanal production or whatever that a lot of the stuff um and i know ellie's going to be nodding because she, she's working on this as well but a lot of the stuff that is said and repeated, if you actually trace it back, you know, it was written once in an article somewhere. Yeah. Um, And then, you know, it becomes repeated so many times that it becomes a truth. And when you actually break it down and you do some experimental archeology span and try to reconstruct that thing, you find out that the reality is completely different. Um, And so it is really interesting how those myths sometimes get generated. it's as you say, Don, it's because there are, you know, we can't be an expert in everything. And that's the other thing about archaeology. You know, if, you, if you're, especially if you're working in the commercial sector in the UK, you could be digging old manor sites yeah. um, all over the place. And so you, you pick up a huge amount of general knowledge, but also you have to, you have to then look at, you know, how, how you can get some of the more specialist interpretation. In. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was good. Just, um, so, uh, uh, was D- Dickie Bennett was the, the main yeah. guy there from Breaking Ground and, and um, yeah D- Dickie just had a very different way of, of, of thinking about the site mm-hmm. and it's 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 that having that kind of back and forth and, and thinking about different things it was yeah really good really added to it. It's a shame we didn't make the, the show like our discussions with each other sometimes you I know could have a whole other boring. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> separate one of us chatting and disagreeing with each other and because that's that is what I think I love the most about working in archaeology in the commercial setting most of the time when they, when we're on the large projects anyway that's what I miss when I'm by myself uh, when you're on mm. certain projects by yourself and then when you're on the large excavations I enjoy interacting with others as we're interpreting something and that's mm. I kind of wish that maybe a little bit of that would have got in but then I don't know how interesting that is to the yeah. public they'll just be like why are these people like looking at these two yeah. things and What's their problem? Why are they arguing over this? It's two different colours of brown. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, I get it's it's when you work on something for the whole because they must shoot throughout the whole week, there must be a hundred hours of, of footage, literally a hundred hours um goes back to the, the cutting room. And it's it's when you've worked on something for the week, um I think isn't the, the program's fantastic and they did a great job, but you could do a whole other program looking at a slightly different aspect of the site that we just don't have time to 
to talk about. Um, you, you could have done a whole program on the quarrying and the quarry evidence. Um, but that's, that's yeah, it, it's when you see a whole week's worth of work fitting into what, 47 minutes. So, um, yeah, it, it reminds you how so much else you could talk about, even for what, what is effectively a not particularly large archaeological intervention into a, a site that isn't isn't particularly big. But um, yeah, there's, there's so much else you could talk about. So. You, you, we could have done a whole um, program on the, remember the bird watchers? Oh God! Oh yeah. <laughs> it was um, it was a uh, was it a t- uh, a tiger flycatcher? Yeah, I think they 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 normally nest in in eastern Siberia Mongolia area, and they they then fly down to um, south uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia f- for the summer. But for some reason, yeah, I think it had been a long long time since one was in Britain. But it was oh, there must have been fifty people there one day. Um, yeah. I think the best thing about that, though, was that we spent quite a lot of time in in small groups up on Trow Point, watching the people down there, watching the bird, going, isn't that weird? Isn't that yeah. weird? They travelled all that way to all stare at that rock. And you think they could equally have been standing, nudging each other and going, aren't they weird? Yeah. Standing up there in this horrible weather, what are they doing? Yeah. Arguing about the colour of soil. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> They were all stood up there just looking down holes. All stood there. Yeah, yeah. What are they doing? <laughs> much better looking at something that actually moves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I think um, it was so fun. You're right, though, about the bird watchers. I think if I remember correctly, it was um, James from the Lighthouse, which is part of the National Trust, um, who came, I think, for a day to visit us. Um, and he was telling us, I remember he was telling me, because I, like, I went down, I thought, what? I kind of dosed off work a little bit. I was like, I want to see this bird. So I went down there. And literally, I don't know where it was. Nobody would talk to me. They were all so possessed over their cameras. Yeah. They literally, nobody was talking. They were all just yeah. looking in the Zooms. It's like, Excuse you me. should have just said, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> start, start running. I see it. I see it. Or just, just pretend to be the bird. Just yeah. like, <laughs> what just, look at me? I just come out to agitate the bird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shout Wait. really loudly and try and frighten it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's considered bad form in <laughs> Well, it was about like a 200 meter long cliff or something. Yeah. So they'd cluster where it was, and then suddenly the bird would fly about 100 meters down yeah. the cliff and they'd all pick up their yeah. cameras and run down in a big group. It was fabulous to it watch. Good. It really was. I, I would, but it's, it's, it's a tiny bird. It's, it's kind of small yeah. blackbirds. Like, but, yeah, it's, it's kind of. Uh, robin sized yeah so it's you know a lot about this Don you know a lot of facts about this <laughs> I think uh, there's, there's something we don't know here isn't there it's, it's, I was, I was revealing tra- something on, out, was like... on the live stream <laughs> I just uh, how do you think the poor bird feels you know I mean all those it's a tiny little bird and all these blooming people pointing massive long cameras at it and then the archaeologists watching them and then <laughs> <laughs> just it must feel I suppose it feels quite special maybe I don't know yeah mm-hmm. it's probably thinking how, how am I going to get home it's like <laughs> thousands of miles away but yeah I think it was there for three days if I remember yeah. correctly yeah yeah for anyone just tuning in we're talking about bird watching yeah <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to the archaeology now yeah. <laughs> by the way I don't think um Normally, at the beginning of every stream, we quickly talk about the permissions that we needed to excavate. Um, actually, let's quickly touch upon that now before we continue, because it's, I think it's quite important for everyone to understand the process. So Jim or Chris, um, I love how Jim's looking at Chris now waiting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, this, this one's Chris. He didn't have permission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> move on, move on. <laughs> So um, this one uh, is another really interesting site in terms of permissions. I've, I've done this before on on, the, on one of these live streams talking about sort of various permissions and, and lots of people we engaged with. And this site um, very much was in the same vein. We obviously, as Jim said, the site's owned by the National Trust. So we worked in partnership um, throughout with the National Trust who, who, who have their own archaeological um, advisors and uh, the the trust not only have their own archaeological advisors they also have a property team who's responsible for that property so we engaged with the trust at, at both those levels and they were fantastically helpful um, and absolutely brilliant to work with 
and they were very supportive of that and of, of the work that we did. Um, as in fact were Natural England, because it's it's worth saying that that not only is the is the site a national trust property with its own sort of level of protection as a, as a guardianship site of the National Trust. It's also a, a site of special scientific interest. So we engaged with Natural England about that, who were also incredibly helpful. Um, we, who else? Oh, the um, local authority archaeological curators. We engaged They're great, with. aren't they? They're they great are, curators. They, they are super, <laughs> super Super people. They're the best. Yeah. <laughs> I used to be a local authority archaeological curator for anyone who missed that or didn't get it. But no. Um, <laughs> that was no less subtle than Chris's sales pitch there going on to create the National Trust Star. <laughs> <laughs> they are brilliant. They're yeah. brilliant. Um, but it's, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so that, that's just everybody that I can think of right now who was involved in, in assisting with, with the permissions. But we got... Um, we got triple SI consent for the work. We obviously worked with um, the National Trust in terms of them being happy with our um, with our methodology for looking at the site, um, and also as as usual, all the work that we did for the program had a, a, a WSI, a, an archaeological method statement, if you like, that was approved um, by the local authority archaeological curator. So there's a lot of work went into it, but it was very worthwhile. And obviously, there's been some great outputs that all of those organisations in one way or another will hopefully benefit from. Brilliant, thank you for that. And we actually had a um, question come in from C.A. Rushton. Oh, Chris. Thank you for your question, Chris. Great series and interesting discussion. So how much of archaeology is an art or interpretation based and how much is working from science? Does technology have more of an impact nowadays? Um, I think it, in terms of, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll dive in on the first part of that question. Um, archaeology uses science, um, but the science can be interpreted in different ways. And so as, as an archaeological scientist myself, I think we have to be quite careful to distinguish between the conclusions from scientific techniques, which can be very robust, and then how those are interpreted. So there, there can be good and bad interpretations. And the classic case study for that right now is in the way that um, ancient DNA is being interpreted. And there's a huge amount of debate in archeology span about how the DNA of, it, it, in some cases that this is being kind of oversimplified. Um, and so there's good science, but then it's what you do with it, I think mm -hmm. would be my answer to that. I, I think with archeological excavation, it's very important to, to think that for something to be truly scientific, it needs to be repeatable. Um, but with e excavation, you, you have one shot at it. As you dig down, you're just effectively destroying the layers in, a, in, a, in an organized way. So I think that's the one thing. Um, there are lots of scientific techniques. And for example, Chloe's um, scientific study of, of glass, you can take those samples and perhaps run different um, different tests or, or, or expose them to um, a different techniques. So in, in that sense, there are some aspects of archaeology that are repeatable, but in terms of excavation and the way you collect the information, you have one shot at it. So I think it's the, um, that, that's why um, the, the process of excavation um, needs to be so carefully organized. You have to prepare a lot in advance. Um, I, th I think, Oftentimes people might approach a site with great enthusiasm, but it's 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 really that kind of that slightly tedious planning bit and, and people won't have seen it on screen, but all the work that Chris and, mm -hmm. and are doing in preparation for the, the site to think we'll watch. Nobody saw that off screen either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's the kind of thing where um, um, that's the that, that's the one element that separates archaeology from from being Kind of a true science is, is that mm -hmm. process of collecting the information when you're doing excavation is not repeatable so that's why we have to be mm. that the paperwork and the measuring and the the um the whole process has to be so carefully controlled it's a that it's a fair that that's a good point though because i think there's a lot of um subjectivity in archaeology and the way everything from the color that you, one person would describe a soil to the color somebody yeah. else would right through to your final interpretation of what that site represents and and 
we try and sort of control that as much as is possible through um, control descriptions, etc. Yeah. Um, and and that is it is it probably it wouldn't make great telly, and it's often quite boring to do. If I'm honest, I yeah. mean nobody really relishes the point where you have to stop digging and looking for things and and draw it all um, yeah. or photograph it or. Um, but it's very necessary, I think, as a as when you're trying to yeah. to to if you like, you know, remove variables from what yeah. you're doing. I think season two needs a Claire's Munsell soil chart <laughs> corner by every episode. Yeah. Claire does five minutes on whether this is mid yellow brown or mid yellow <laughs> brown. <laughs> I get very um, concerned about describing context because I think, although we do have those set terminologies, I think one person's yellowish grey, you know, is another person's <laughs> greyish red. Or yeah. <laughs> but, I, yeah. I did work with someone who, um, on a on a watching brief, who were obviously extremely bored, described one layer as um, as brown as the fur on the back of a rabbit's neck. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I, I think there was one um, the color of bears. I think that yeah uh, yeah <laughs> wrote descriptions on context sheets. Yeah, I feel like I wrote something on one of the context sheets from one of these digs for the amusement of whoever did the post text. <laughs> I don't think um, it's surfaced yet. Then yeah. so. <laughs> I'm trying to think which one it was, and I don't know. <laughs> I remember having a good chat with you, Ellie, when we were at Trout Point and you were um, drawing the section of the weapons pit. Um, and I can't remember what you were talking about um, interpretation and how it differs. Yeah. But you were also saying that, you know, you thought that ultimately in the big picture, it, the differences would be minor, I think, something like I, I'm going to let yeah. you explain it. So, yeah, basically, I, I was going to chime in on that actually, um, because, yeah, I think of archaeology. So I, I want to say first, because I'm very passionate about it, uh, field archaeology is uh, specialism. So a lot of people think that they can go and dig up stuff. That's not how it works. It is a specialism in its own right. So if you are a commercial archaeologist and you do field archaeology, you're a specialist. Yes. So having said this and set this straight, um, yeah, <laughs> what I was saying is, um, yes, of course, I, I would define archaeology as a qualitative discipline, if that makes sense, because it's so subjective. But what I was saying, so when I was drawing the section, I had my story. Of course, we have in jargon, lumpers and splitters, right? So people who see um, different layers, whereas maybe I, I may be seeing, so they are the splitters, and maybe I see two layers. Um, of course, each layer is an event. If the events are minor, and your mind lumps them together, it doesn't matter. If ultimately the story you're telling, if it's got a slight variation, but the overall picture is, is the, the main story, the big story that you're telling is the same. You could have you know, people telling different stories, but if the, the main elements are there, it doesn't really matter. Um, so that's how I see it. Because again, you could have, you know, we could all be given the same um, archaeological section, I mean, with the different soils, not, and then draw it, we'd all come, come up with um, a slightly different drawing, because there, there could be many factors in, there could be experience, there could be how your mind works, who you are, um, but if we all, in the end of the day, tell the same, sim well, a similar story with all the main elements that are there, we've done our job, and obviously along our story, we support our story with the finds that we can have coming from layers. Um, we may not have any. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, in the end of the day, if you know, if the, the main message comes through, that's yeah, yeah. that's all it mm -hmm. takes. That's a really good point there. It's like something um it just reminds me of when we have a lens or the interface between two two different deposits. Some people may give that a context number, the other may not. They may just document it on the, when they're drawing it, during the section, and that's about it. And maybe they might mention it in the sheet, one of the sheets, one of the context sheets. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, the context sheets are the documents that we use to describe each deposit. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting points there, Lee, actually. Well, I would say it would also depend what type of site you're digging. Of course, if you're digging a Paleolithic site with like a, a teaspoon and a, a chopstick, well, maybe you want to, and again, you're talking about, I don't know, maybe um, occupation levels that are like one millimeter thick. You already have an idea on how to um, kind of react to the stratigraphy. Whereas if you may have different types of 
sites you could have different approaches but again it's like if you have um a, a layer that's made up of different dumps of stuff yeah you can document them all but you've made kind of you just kind of went more in depth into the story of like an event that could have happened basically in a very narrow time frame because you know it could mm -hmm. be like that so again it, as long as I think as long as the main elements are there again nobody was there we can't go back in time and tell what actually happened but yeah as long as we and again we dig systematically so like yeah if we have different layers overlapping we just don't dig randomly because then that's we don't understand that that's the point where we don't understand the mm. story so I think we have it's 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 a discipline where you have to be systematic in what you do you can't just skip your steps but also there's an interpretive factor that comes into play because yeah, yeah that's how it goes and I think as well it's important to say for people that you know although although we talk a lot about how interpretive it is I think the point you've made is so important, Ellie, because of course um, there is an element of interpretation and, and we have to be mindful of that. But at the same time, um, we spend a lot of time understanding how sites are formed. So what we call site formation processes, you know, how stuff gets in the ground and what happens to it after it's in the ground. And so we, we apply the same principle that's applied in geology, which is that, you know, if if this is the way that something happens today, if we watch, say, something eroding and look at what that does, then we can assume that, you know, a similar sort of thing eroding in the past would have responded in the same way. So we spend a lot of time, although it's not scientific in the sense that no site is repeatable, there's, there's a lot of time and energy spent into understanding why things look the way they do and what that's, what that's linked back to. So it is really kind of, it is a discipline that's, that, that adopts, I suppose, scientific methods and uses a scientific approach. But as Don said, technically can never be a science in itself because we can't test our results. We can't test those findings. Brilliant. Okay. I'm sorry, when I start talking about science, it doesn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been rambling on forever. <laughs> Uh, so talking about layers. <laughs> now this this made me come into mind something very silly. So I remember uh, someone once uh, that presented me a, a drawing of this. I don't know, it was a weird feature. It looked like a bean and plan. Uh, so we half sectioned it. And, um, so well, it had kind of two different fills. But basically, this person wanted to draw something that I don't know. It was it looked like one of those candies, like the cross section of a candy. So like different circles within like something that was U shaped. And I was like, look, that's not how gravity works. <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah, anyway, it, it was funnier when it happened. Now, talking about the stratigraphy though, um, I think the trench I was working in at Trail Point was actually um, surprisingly difficult to, to dig and interpret because it was the trench that became known as the trench within a trench and uh, it had so many recuts and it was in turn cut into material that was probably representative of several phases of landscaping and dumping and um, although notionally you were excavating the fill of a, a single feature um, you, in archaeology you, you tend to try and establish something that is good and reliable as either a natural or an edge or a and with that one it was a constant process of I don't think I trust that and I'm not sure I trust the bottom I don't really know if I trust this side and there was a quite a bit of feeling like um this on the face of it will end up probably looking quite straightforward but it's really quite challenging to work on um which is probably off topic, but it was suddenly struck me as we were discussing uh, layers and how far, as Ellie says, on some sites, if it if if it all represents some infill from post Second World War, would it matter if one of those layers was from June 1952 and one of them was from August 1952? And sometimes that would make a huge difference to what you know about the site. And sometimes you could probably safely say it's all part of gradual infilling, but mm. We had quite a lot of interesting discussions and time spent staring at the sides of that and 
trying to work out if a bottom was really a bottom or if a side was really a side or um but I think it was a really it was really interesting to dig and I think one of the nice things about it was when you got right down almost to the bottom it revealed those stake holes that still had the wood um in situ and that you could rely on that you were like right that that's a structural element um so what it's sitting in is probably not natural and what it's um uh, is built up against it is probably not natural um but it kind of kept on giving it, it kept getting to a point where you thought I think we might have at the base of that and then you dig into it a bit more and it just it carried on it would have been really great to have had the time to put sections as we intended to across all the bits of that trench network and compare how they related but um it was definitely my favorite um feature that I dug on the Great British Dig well, we teased Claire a bit um, until that, bit. that one because <laughs> every time, and relentlessly teased. Every time you got you got the sort it's of sterile awful. rubbish trench. Rusty puppy, as Chris called them. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, uh, I think it was at Benwell when I thought I was getting um, an outer wall and a corner tower, and what I got was quite a lot of rubble, which. <laughs> is nobody's favourite thing to remove. Um, and then right in its dying throes, the runty puppy suddenly revealed itself to be slightly less runty. And, uh, <laughs> and then at, at Lent and I got um, sort of a lot of the same stuff and, and then possibly a, an alluvium at the bottom. Um, and then at Mash, Massam, I got more rubble, didn't I? Yeah, you know, got a garden with some rubble in it. <laughs> that was the worst one. <laughs> Beautiful that, setting, but the worst. That nearly broke me, I'll be honest. That yeah. one stuck very solidly into something really claggy. Um, so <laughs> long I was alone picking at, sorry, I'm going to a dark place. Let's change the subject. <laughs> <laughs> I remember finding you in the garden in Nassim. You'd constructed yourself a sort of little nest in a, oh. <laughs> in a swing seat. Do you know what it is? I, I, I really think that the people who owned that house were very worried I was setting up some kind of shanty town in their garden. At that point. I think they had, they had deep fears that um, I wasn't leaving. Uh, <laughs> I had the frame of their swing with a really kind of mud splattered tarpaulin draped over it and their garden seat um, dragged inside where I was sitting quite comfortably out of the rain um, working hard and uh, but I, I don't think aesthetically it was really enhancing their beautiful garden very much. <laughs> no you, you looked like you were protesting like the building of a new bypass or something. <laughs> It looked, like, it looked like the world's rubbishest mini Glastonbury. <laughs> I've got several videos that I made that day um, from both inside um, my little garden shanty town and from outside as well uh, that I sent to my family to uh, let them see what I get up to when I'm at work, you know. We watch a lot of Ed Stafford survival shows in our family and so I really felt like if Ed could see me in that garden, he'd be really proud of the job that I'd done, um, <laughs> staying alive in the uh, in the downpours, using only what I had to hand. <laughs> That's a really long personal experience yeah. story about your it's experience. It's like the big brother. <laughs> Well, this is true behind the scenes action, isn't it? You know, that's true. That's true. It's the element that we were missing in every single live stream. <laughs> Claire, Claire refused every single time to come. She was completely busy. <laughs> you know, so much to do these days. Oh, wait. <laughs> just, um, by the way, oh, sorry, Claire. Um, I'm just crying a little. Just crying. Tears of joy, I hope. Thinking back on my lovely house at Masson. <laughs> <laughs> that was a beautiful garden. We did call, it was called the it was Secret lovely. Garden. It was lovely, um, that, and yeah. honestly, I didn't actually see that garden until the end, so I didn't know where you were. So <laughs> it was a secret. <laughs> yeah. It was quite good for hiding out. And also the gate had quite a rattly clasp, so you got a good <laughs> warning to uh, to look busy when you... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, took it really hard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
by the way, for our viewers at home, this is a live q and If you have any questions for us, now is your time to get that in quickly as we've hit the hour mark. Um, yeah, we're getting loads of uh, crying emojis for you, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> Free the mass on one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did have a question. Um, okay, so we're getting a lot of questions about series two. If there's a series, season two, uh, from Barbara, Delby, Real Dab, um, Emily, and Annex. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know, not just yet. You'll probably find out before us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything goes online. No idea, but it was an absolute pleasure to work and, and meet everybody. Um, yeah. So definitely. Uh, I'm going to go back up a little bit. Do, 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 do. I think we're all we're all hopeful that there might be it, the reception seems to be generally really positive. We've had some really nice feedback, kind of personally and professionally, not just like my mom telling me I look good <laughs> on camera. Um, there's actually been some like genuinely nice feedback about about the show. So I think I think we're all hopeful that there might be a second series. But like Tash says, we just we just don't know at the moment, unfortunately. Mm. Definitely. Um, yep, yeah, so some comments coming in. Oh, that's nice. Delby said, the best episode out of the four, so we're talking about episode four. Um, the next day, my daughter was learning about trench warfare in World War One. so hopefully we'll be able to visit that site or other sites nearby. That's great to hear. Um, lovely comment from Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. The shows, uh, the shows are good to watch, but your online chat highlights how much more there was to it. Almost needs two episodes per dig, one being producer's, <laughs> producer's edition and a second with Digger's perspective. We would love that if there was a second one. <laughs> It'd just be 45 minutes of Chris and Claire arguing around the chat. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. literally what happens on site. <laughs> People love it though, don't I'm they? Are, I'm in if you are, Chris. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, it'd be brilliant, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I'd like to see, like, everyone have GoPros, you know, so you can... Yeah. Uh, like, Claire Cam, you can just switch, right? I'm going to switch to Claire Cam now. Oh, look, she's inside a weird, like, tent in someone's garden. <laughs> oh, what's she building now? No, no but some, someone get yeah. to Claire's garden. Hello. What's, right, Put what's she doing? Oh, look, Chris has is, Chris is nipped off somewhere. Where's he gone? Oh, the camera's gone off. Who knows? <laughs> emergency call <laughs> you know that's a good point actually um because we most of us were mic'd and we would forget that we're mic'd so <laughs> all of a so sudden you'd be like are people listening to me right now yeah. i don't know <laughs> you get really it's paranoid great. yeah it does doesn't it it makes you completely paranoid um you get used to you kind of realize that sound guys hear everyone pee I say sound yeah. guys, there are sound women as well. We just had, uh, I was just thinking of the ones that asked uh, on, on that yeah. show, but um, they definitely hear um, everyone weeing and you just kind of get over that. But it's then that you kind of, you get to this point where you think that someone's always listening to you, don't you? So yeah. it's it's quite, it's quite, um, it's quite disturbing actually. And then you leave site and you're like, oh, no one's listening to me. No one's filming me. Like, <laughs> it's really weird. We had some... Chris, was it you who said something and yes. didn't realise? Yeah, I couldn't remember who it was. but Thanks, Jim. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Under the bus. Under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was. Uh, it was actually at Massam, which we talked about last week. Um, I was talking to uh, Hannah, who was our bone, animal bone specialist on that, um, on that project, and asking Hannah to look after the finds but very carefully and explaining that TV people don't understand how important it is that the archaeologists need everything numbered and the number has to go with the thing everywhere. And it's an unbroke, an unbreakable bond of number with thing. And uh, yeah, and they all heard. All you were heard being really thing. uncharitable about the TV people's very uncharitable. approach to <laughs> finds, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I should say that the TV people are excellent at what they do. Yeah, and, uh, and you're not uh, mic'd up now, Chris. The sound no, guys can't enough. hear yeah, you. No. no, fair enough. It doesn't matter. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, that did happen. <laughs> well, listen, I, mean, I talk to myself a lot, which is you know, which is problematic when you're mic'd up. I sort of walk around muttering angrily to myself quite frequently. So that's, they must have had an absolute treat. 
<laughs> Angry yeah. little voice constantly in your ear. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I should have just <laughs> putting the peg over there. <laughs> but you know, they said that um, if like nobody was answering their radios and they need to work out where you are, they would just try to listen to the sound to see if they could work out where you were. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be like you're hiding or something. Yeah. <laughs> or it's like, you know, in someone else's trench or something like that. So yeah, you have to turn off your mic, guys. That's a tip. If you ever do do anything, turn your mic off if you want to run away and, and not be found. Um, okay, so other comments coming in. <laughs> Again, Gordon, thank you. Uh, thanks to Tash and all of you for doing this. It adds value and interest, a great promo for the vast range of work that is archaeology. Thank you, Gordon, for that. That's honestly the, the main motivation nice. behind this live stream is to show there's so much going on on and off screen, well, off screen, a lot going on off screen. So we want to give this opportunity for everybody to, to speak um, about it. Um, da, da, da. Again, lovely comment from Barbara. I have thoroughly enjoyed all four episodes and the live streams. Love the dynamics you all have brought into archeology. span Hope to see more of this engagement into mainstream TV. We hope so too. <laughs> yeah, I <let's> hope. <laughs> This is a great one from Delby, and I think I understand what you mean. Um, I think in regards to episode four, um, obviously we have the, the gun emplacement. Now, if there is such thing as the coastal erosion coming in, would there be plans to maybe move that out of the way? Because um, the question was, uh, are there any plans to reclaim the land or move the fines further inland? So I'm assuming we're talking about the gun emplacement um, being moved. Who can say it? I don't know. Is there? I suppose it's, it's worth, I suppose, pointing out that uh, that gun emplacement is actually a listed building. So it's it it in and of itself has has historic significance, which is recognised through a, um, a grade two listing. Um, particularly of the emplacement, the gun itself is actually a replica already. The gun, um, but it would be difficult because I, I can only imagine that there are thousands of tons of concrete in in that emplacement. Yeah. So uh, also, I suppose the thing really draws a lot of its significance, a lot of its interest from where it is. So removed from that, um, would it have the same interest? I'm not not too sure. Even if you could pick it up and move it um but it's it's i suppose it's worth saying uh, as has been said already as don said uh, we we did take apart a little bit of that site to and and destroy a little bit of it to understand a bit more um but that site is one of the reasons that the program went there is and and did the work that we did is because it it it's recognized it's been recognized through work that historic england have um have commissioned that that site needs um needs to be investigated before it's lost so yeah. it, it was um seen through the um it was recognized through the northeast rapid coastal zone assessment which sort of looked at the archaeology of the northeast coast as as a site of of, of, of particular interest and also a particular threat so that was one of the reasons one of the drivers for for doing that and and of course there's more archaeology there that we we could have investigated so in the same way um, as as what we've done, that, that there there is more to do there before it's before it's lost. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, and yeah, and and you're right. I think about its location does add something to it, the the significance and what would it be outside of that context. It's it's an yeah. interesting point there actually. Um, I don't think it will have the same not value, but the same like appeal as a cannon, for example, when a cannon's taken out of place. People love the look of that, but you can easily can move that around a lot more easier. Yeah. Um, okay, other questions. Craig, thank you, Craig Rycroft for your comments. First saying, couldn't agree more, no frills archeology, span it was great. And then, um, very valid point, Craig. Craig mentions, a disappointing thing about this week's show is that we don't have a funny meme. <laughs> We do have something, but you might not have seen it, and that was Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chloe's, Chloe's pushing that quite hard. I did, yeah. Yeah. Making I did princess make a little gif. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little gif on Twitter, I think, of Jim fluttering his eyes. <laughs> Very reminiscent of the famous Princess Diana interview from the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> the, sort of looking up. 
yeah that was that was what it was modeled on so i'm glad you were yeah, I'm glad you caught that <laughs> <laughs> um, brilliant. Uh, oh, this is interesting, Nigel. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for setting this up. It's a tr real treat to be able to talk back to program makers. If it hadn't been for Radio Times piece, I would have missed everything. It's really interesting, actually, to do the promotional element of the show and um, public interest. I think it's, if we were able to get a second series, hopefully we'd be able to, to do more with it. If they give us material to post, that is. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> Um, oh, and this is another point, thank you, I didn't think about that, um, from Alex. We do have um, a room on Clubhouse called Archaeology and History 101. So if you do have iPhone, only for iPhone or iOS users at the moment, you can come and head over to our club, where Chloe is also a member, um, if you remember that is. <laughs> Are you on it as well? Are you on Clubhouse, Don? No, no. No, you're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> Will you? Will you join? I don't have an iPhone, unfortunately. I was not, thinking, okay, so when Android comes, sent in the club, but yeah. It's not okay, so just so, so you guys know that we are also on there, so you're able to chat to us um, every day, actually, Monday to Friday, every day at two p.m. GMT. I'm on there with some other archaeologists and historians, chatting away different topics every day, and on Sundays at five, four between four and five p.m. as well. Um, just plugging myself in. Anyway, and by the way, if any of you have an iPhone or get an iPhone, let me know and I'll send you an invite and then you have to come and talk to me on there. You can't escape from me now. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> uh, let's see what else. I think I've answered all the questions so far. Um, if there's any more questions, um, viewers, please write them right now um, before we go offline. And Ellie, how was your experience this time digging in your lovely weapon pit? I think that's what we interpreted as in the end. Yeah, um, this time as in compared to which other time, um, like the... Were you not on the first? Wait, was this? I can't remember. Ah, oh, you weren't, were you? I was, meant, I was meant to be, but then I don't remember why it happened because now time is a concept and memories are a concept of it. That's a bit alien to me. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good experience. Um, yeah, the part I didn't enjoy, which I never enjoy anyway. And also back in my commercial archaeology days, I would rely on diggers to do that is the deturfing and backfilling. Um, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, the digging itself, it was nice. Um, I love digging in sand. Um, of course, the, the fill of the weapons pit was in sand, but it was cut in sand, um, which can be quite tricky to dig because you have to be very careful. You, you are, if you are a bit too much forceful, you know, you can make out shapes from sand. So you have to be very, you have to try and be rigorous with what you do. And also I like when you get some features. This one was a bit like that. When, you, when you're a bit like, hmm, I don't really understand what's going on. I'll carry on a bit more. Oh, I understand now. Hmm, let me chase this. And then, yeah, you just dig it. So I don't know if I made any sense, but I was like picturing myself back in the mud looking grumpy because I saw myself a couple of times looking like wind battered, um, completely wet and looking like this trying to do stuff um but yeah i enjoyed it the only thing i didn't enjoy was probably also the weather besides the deturfing and backfilling but what can you do <laughs> like yeah i would definitely have to say um a, a unique experience digging on a cliff that's the first for me uh, being on a cliff i can't think of any other experiences of actually excavating on that and claire can hats off because you think i'm the worst <laughs> It was like a little microclimate over at that trench. But the thing was, once it's an incentive to dig a deep hole, isn't it? Because the quicker you can dig yourself in uh, some shelter, in the absence of a trusty um, abandoned swing frame, dirty tarp and someone's garden furniture to make myself uh, <laughs> a shelter. Or what do you know? We're back on my Ed Stafford shelters. So what I found was... <laughs> <laughs> so and my trench was there. It was kind of like you... Walked across the headland thinking, oh, it's a bit fresh. And then you got closer to mine and you were a bit more hot, sort of head down into it. And then you dropped right into the trench and you were like, ah, that's fine. I'm out of it. I'm undercover. 
and then he just curled up, as Chloe, I think, said, <laughs> like a paper clip, and uh, hoped no one came by and asked you any questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really proud. I thought I'd done a beautiful job um, of my sections and things, although it was quite a clay-based soil, and it's not... Um, it doesn't clean up very nicely, not when it dries out. And I went over like a smuggle to Ellie and Chloe to go, come and have a look at me feature that I've done. And uh, then I saw Ellie's like textbook, beautiful <laughs> section. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you want something, Claire? No, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Are you finished? No, I've got <laughs> <laughs> but well I have to say I didn't have the clay um but yeah, yeah clay is horrendous <laughs> I mean um I did once I did like my neck in digging in clay in winter um so then basically I had to walk for like a week like this and the only thing <laughs> was sections and like do contact sheets um yeah so yeah the sloppy or like you know when it's very clay and claggy and horrible that you have wellies or whatever and then you end up with like wedges yeah. <laughs> oh god oh uh, yeah once I also decided because I'm an idiot I decided to um kind of yeah it was that sort of like soil and it was on this site and there was kind of like a spoil heap and I decided to jump from the spoil heap onto the ground but there was more like spoil um so basically by jumping I kind of well left my wellies in the <laughs> so yeah don't ever do that it's also not health and safety recommended but yeah. i think it caught a couple of the, the ladies who came to volunteer out as well in um the second trench that we put across one of those trenches because they were quite steep sided actually and it had been quite a wet morning and uh they were uh lethally slippy and so these two poor ladies got in and we tried to describe how we were cleaning these sides back and uh, they, they sort of looked it up and down and I think decided maybe the archaeology wasn't for them after all. <laughs> they did some valiant troweling of the top bits and one lady had a really lovely um, bright yellow mac on and I said to her, I, I, I hate to break this to you, but I don't think your mac will stay that clean yeah. um, for very long. And her friend turned to me and went, trust me, it will look exactly the same. When <laughs> <laughs> and it did. Not a speck on it. <laughs> As you're a I got, ones, yeah. <laughs> got a shout out to some of the locals who came even on the worst weather yeah. days. Because there were a couple of people who were coming even when it was horrendous. Yeah. Mm. Hats mm. off to them because I wouldn't have if I'd had yeah. the choice. <laughs> Um, I can't remember his name, but the, he, he was the chap who was digging with you a lot, Chloe, up in the um, uh, who was on camera. He was brilliant. He came back on backfill day, like after the cameras had gone. Oh, wow. he, he just he just rocked up with his own spade and shovel. It was like, right, do you need hand, lads? And me and Chris were like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> volunteers coming back on backfill day after the cameras have cut. Yeah. It's like fantastic. Yeah. That's so sweet so, for you. I know. Yeah, yeah. It was, he was lovely. He was a lovely guy. Really lovely. <laughs> it was nice as well. I know, um, I think people were wondering why we had quite a lot in the in the kind of northeast. And and I, I know you you guys said before, Chris and Jim, that you know, you were partly thinking when you kind of put forward those sites, you were partly thinking about obviously, you know, the virus and everything. But it was quite nice that then some of the people that were involved, like Chris, you know, South Shields, and we had one of the diggers um, that was in that episode and also in Benwell was Dolphine, who mm. is also from Benwell as well, or lives in Benwell. So um, there were there were even among the team there were lots of kind of local connections. It was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean in part it, um, we we looked at a, a lot of sites for the for the episodes um, and through various reasons some sites were we weren't able to um to incorporate into the the series just through through time um and thing, things like that and and kind of working with people just just ran out of time on some sites so just in part just just so happened that we ended up with um with sites more in the sort of north of england and, and then obviously in in nottingham as well um 
if if another series happens, I think we obviously would love to get out and, and do you can't call a program the Great British Dig and not try and get about the place and do <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and do more. But um it just just so happened that that was the case obviously from my point of view I'm delighted for having lived in South Shields for for 10 years and having loads of family there to dig a site in South Shields um of course but I only moved away from South Shields moved an hour and a half away from South Shields two months before digging in South oh. Shields, <laughs> having wanted to dig that site for 10 years but there we go um and your mom so, got to bring your birthday present out didn't she um, Thanks for that, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then didn't you bring your packed lunch that day? You forgot it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the lunches were great at South Shields. Oh, I they were, weren't they? Yeah. They were. Yeah. yeah. What's the name of the... Um... the sand yeah, dancer. We should be promoting. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, it. Sand Dancer. Yeah. Dance, yeah. It's... Lots of fried halloumi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> memories. Mm. <laughs> so Porsches as well, weren't they? Are oh, amazing. Yeah. And then the temptation to just eat chips every day, even though you knew you had quite a lot of clay soil to deal with in the afternoon, <laughs> and trying to structure your day so you'd have some less intensive bit of work to do after your fried chicken and chips yeah. for dinner. <laughs> I, yeah, I'd like to address that point, actually. I put on so much weight over four weeks of filming. So it's four <laughs> weeks, but it's spread out between, I think, about six weeks. You can literally see it, it the, the way I look in the Benwell episode <laughs> versus the way I look in the last one. And it's, do you know what I pin it on? It's not just the chips. There was, there was a person from the production team who would go around with a bin bag filled with snacks, like it had all these different kinds of crisps in it. It had posh corn in it um chocolate everything and they'd go around and you know you'd be there and like someone mentioned last week someone bring you a lovely hot tea and then they'd, they'd like open this massive sack and you'd like dive in and stuff yourself with crisps and whatnot I mean it was fab I do miss having someone chasing me around with snacks <laughs> yeah and you could literally see my progress throughout the, <laughs> throughout the series <laughs> by mass and we all look sort of like a bit pale and kind of bloated and a bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah we should we should actually mass was actually the last one that we filmed even though it's a second the others appear oh. in the order that we filmed them though yeah. you heard it here but don't tell anyone <laughs> the I magic of television went chronologically no it does yeah roman medieval oh, yeah. whatever yeah so Whatever. actually, it looks like we got fitter and healthier yeah. as the series <laughs> went on. Or oh, we got really unfit and then randomly <laughs> fitter again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was nice, though, because, I mean, considering that we'd all been living under lockdown, it was a, like a weird form of crazy socialising, wasn't it? Because yeah. you were kind of getting to go and, and hang out with your mates in what felt like an, an almost normal environment or... Maybe it felt like a weird environment, but when all life is weird, why not just, you know, yeah. go weirder? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to um, ask Don, um, what was the most interesting finds out of there for you? Because I don't think this episode we got really to see that much. I know it in um, Benwell. It was the stopper. Did... Yeah. Stopper. <laughs> That's the stopper that I found. I was very lucky because I was in the, um, I was mainly, because it was a, a, a very much kind of modern site, there weren't, there wasn't really many environmental samples from this one. We did have the, um, that layer of um, uh, pine wood, so that, that kind of helped with the interpretation of the, of the, uh, the house. Although I was very lucky because for much of the week I was um, back at Dick HQ with um, hiding from the, I must say I wasn't, I wasn't out in the rain all week, so that was good. I was with um, Andy Robertshaw, who was the, um, the fines advisor. So it was, it was just really nice to, um, and it was great to talk to Andy. And, and, and again, you don't, you can only see a fraction of it in the program, but he's so knowledgeable about um, just all the tiny details about dealing with military um, items. And again, it's a good example where um, any of us would say, oh, we found a bullet. And then he's saying, well, it was produced in this factory in this month and it's this type of bullet and it cannot and you just it's just stuff you don't don't really um you just don't appreciate and even things as basic as 
it, uh, you can look in a practice trench and say, oh, there's some barbed wire. And he would say, oh, but it's, it must be this type because it's this and this. And um, again, he's hugely knowledgeable and, and he's been on, even hearing his stories and all the, all the movies he, he is, he's advised on. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's um, yeah, it was, it was, I, I really enjoyed hearing him um, talk about the fines and just his, his encyclopedic knowledge was really good. I think that the single most interesting find was that the, um, the ceramic jug from Riga um, again, just as an unusual item, but um, as, as Tash said in the, in the program, it's, there's, there is that Baltic trade between the Northeast and, and um, the Baltic states and Scandinavia. Um, and it's, it's, it's just a really, um, it's a very tangible example of that, that trade, but it's just, it's a nice, it was a nice find and, and we can link it, link it to that, um, uh, that uh, is it Ludwig Willem Kukovius, the, the, yeah. um, very important industrialist in Riga in, in 1890 to, to 1905. Um, mm. Yeah, so I thought that that was really a single piece that had a, a big story, but uh, yeah, it was good. It was, I was on the sort of little finds um, table for, during the end of Dig Party when all the all the, all the the community were coming through. So I had the, the Black Balsam jug from Latvia yeah. there as one of the finds. And... It didn't make it on camera, but um, we'd done a little bit more finds cleaning up, a little bit more work um, just before that party. And the black balsam, which is the particular type of alcohol that shipped in that in that um, that clay jug, mm. um, it it was quite often taken medicinally as a digestive, yeah. um, like for people with stomach complaints. And um, just next to it. Uh, like literally a couple of feet away, there was a small glass bottle found that didn't get on camera. And it was um, a brand from America known as De Haven's Dyspepsia Destroyer. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that someone in that house was having a real trouble with their digestive system. Yeah, and yeah, were yeah. trying any old thing they could get their hands on yeah, to yeah. look after. But it is, it's it's a very, it's a very human story all of a sudden. And just yeah. from a couple of pieces of finds, I think, that that yeah the the black balsam jug was fabulous but in the context of that house with a bunch of other little bits and pieces like mm. that it was it was great fun it was lovely it's good yeah finding that bottle i i remember um i was there robin just pulled it out i think i just jumped out of the trench and then i think i went to shovel or something and then robin just pulls this out out and we're all like he's like oh we're like, oh sweet yeah yeah you got a stoneware bottle and then he's wiping it and when he's like wait a minute <laughs> that's not English yeah. like, and then I was like crap <laughs> <laughs> panic literally I remember I was like Robin just one second please took a photo called my husband I was like here you go Robin I was like Sasha I need you to have a look at this right now I go because I know I'm gonna if I start googling it's gonna take me way too long to understand what I'm reading um can you please tell me what it is and you've got like four minutes <laughs> I could see the camera crew coming and I was like literally can you just tell me right now what everything is and he did he was able to give me enough. <laughs> classic example of an, of not knowing something, but knowing the person who took yeah. it. Yes, there you but, go. Yeah. Um, knowing but, enough to know who to ask, isn't yeah. it? Being able to recognise yeah. what it is. Yeah, exactly. I like I love that bottle. My grandfather was Latvian and he was from Riga. So um it's always nice. It's not a place that people tend to think about Latvia. Yeah. But yeah, it was a lovely find. It really was, definitely my fave. Shame we couldn't talk about it more, but fine, whatever. I'll get over it. But it's so lovely, the bit that's in there, um, because it's yeah. so obvious how excited you are with it as well. Yeah. And it was genuine, you know. I, I yeah. saw you bouncing around the site with that thing. Uh <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I definitely was. <laughs> It's one of us chasing even... after you with a fines bag, trying to get it bagged and numbered. Yeah. <laughs> I think you even made the long walk over to my windy uh, hellhole to show me that. <laughs> <laughs> Just show what you were missing out on. Yeah. <laughs> well, my stopper, those two um, war department stoppers that came out of the trench were one of my favourite things um, that we found on any of the digs. Because I think, again, when you're trying to... Uh, establish a, a chronology within um, a certain time period of what wh what belongs to which period um, they're pretty good for going right this will really help nail something down because yes. it's a Bakelite stopper or whatever that says war department mm -hmm. on it that will be dateable <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed the, uh, the it didn't really get much airtime, but we found a, a 10p piece that was actually from 1968 
which is actually pre-decimalization. So we were all quite confused by that. And then, you know, get the phone out and, and, and look it up. And, uh, and it turns out they minted a few of them before decimalization kicked in. I don't know, it's like getting people uh, used to it or whatever. Yeah. But I thought, what a cool find. Like, you know, there can't be that many of those out there. Really. I can imagine someone going up to try point and saying, this, this rubbish will never catch on and just like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we found those, those coppers that we found um, in the in my trench, um, the, there was like two little discrete scatters of them. And I think I had this whole sad vision of a, of a, you know, a family up there having like their picnic on their day out at the coast and promising their kids ice creams before they got the bus home. And then they get to the ice cream stand and they've lost all their coppers out of their pocket. And, you know, that's it. The yeah. Kids have to yeah. get on the bus in tears and the whole day is ruined. Um, so you're at a site, a let's, just, let's just nail this down. You're at a site where, Soldiers were training before they went off to war, and presumably quite a lot of them would have been killed. Um, and you managed to make a tragedy out of a story of a family <laughs> having a picnic. That's a talent. <laughs> That's a real talent. <laughs> and what were we saying about archaeology being subjective again? <laughs> I've got four coins that I've basically created this whole scenario that I can picture, you know, little Johnny and Katie on the bus home. <laughs> yeah. But daddy, what about my ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm actually flashing back to something that happened in my yeah, childhood. I don't know my parents. <laughs> I think so. Um, this is a great question from Gordon that just popped up. How long does it take to research and prepare for an episode and later post-production? We don't see that side, but they, they're obviously also essential components to the programmes. Chris or Jim? <laughs> I think there's a how long would we like it to take and how long does it take? Did it take? Yeah. That's a, yeah, there's just two very different answers there. Um, with this one, it was very, it was what we assume to be a very compressed time scale because it, there was the worry about a second lockdown. We'd just come out of lockdown mm. one. We had a very narrow window for filming. Um and we had to get everything in place. We had to get on the ground and we had definite deadlines for that. So what did, it was probably a couple of months at most for, for all the research, all the admin for the first four sites for this series one. Um, in an ideal world, I think we'd, we'd, look, we'd hope to have more like three or four months minimum lead into this sort of thing. Um, in the event, we did all that. We managed to get all the due diligence done. We did all the research we needed. We did got everything done, but it was very tight. Um, in terms of after the fact, the TV side of it, uh, well, what we finished filming in, was it, it was oct late October, Mid wasn't it? At Masson. Yeah. Uh, Masson was the last one filmed, and that was towards the back end of October. We wrapped. Mm -hmm. And um, is, that, is that what TV people say? Did I use that word right? Um, and then um, and then we saw we saw a first cut just before Christmas, and all the programs were delivered to Channel Four just early in the new year. So they did a two, again. It was a two month turnaround, which I understand is quite again quite a tight tight schedule. I think they would have in an ideal world liked more but uh because of the nature of how weird 2020 was for everyone yeah. in the entire world this was done under slightly unusual circumstances so uh, that's that's to the best of my recollection anyway brilliant um Let's see. Let's try, I'm going to start wrapping it up now, everybody. Um, and don't forget to hit that like, share, and subscribe button on the actual video itself because you are all uh, commenting on the live chat. So if you can head over after the video is finished and put an actual comment, that'd be amazing. Um, and we've got links to everybody's um, socials and websites as well. So check out Solstice Heritage, Archiduck's YouTube channel. And then I'll put the Twitter accounts of these three. I just realised where I am might not be the same as where you are on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> You're just pointing. I'm just pointing. Yeah. <laughs> but Don, Don needs to, we need to get Don's videos um, yeah. on Instagram or even on YouTube themselves because yeah. he puts them only on Twitter right now and they are brilliant, uh, but they're only on Twitter. So you're not being accessible, are you, Don? Only fans. <laughs> That's the right word. <laughs> 
Am I saying that right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, okay. Um, I'm going to have nightmares about that now. I'm <laughs> done being on OnlyFans. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Let, 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 me, let me just check. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> Ali, what are you going to say? I know it's something very silly that this sound may, may sound even creepier, but yeah, I'd pay for that content on OnlyFans. <laughs> Good to know. I, <laughs> it's important to define what content here. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think you could offer a service where you shave your beard into any shape that people request because the, the monkey tail you did was excellent. I oh, thought. yeah. That was good. Yeah. Um, you, you've, got a, you've got a good beard to work with. Yeah. I, I one's got it swag. You've got did swag. You, my, it, was a good, it was a good monkey tail as well. It was. Um, maybe after <laughs> done, I'll, I'll try walking around Newcastle for a bit with it and see what I get. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, by content, I, I meant just um, the things that Don posts on Twitter. Yes, I, yeah, yeah. But I think, yeah, you can... Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Um, I'm just going to end just with a few more comments before we wrap up. Um, dun, dun, dun. Ah, this is a nice comment from Craig. I'm just going to um, sum up a little bit. Um, how did everyone feel about being on camera? Because um, obviously there's being in a trench and you're digging and you're talking to each other and then there's a camera. Or if you remember there's a camera, sometimes we're being filmed and we don't know the camera's nearby because <laughs> you forget, <laughs> become so used to seeing everybody. Um, so how did it feel for everybody? And for example, for uh, Chloe and John and myself, we make videos that we put online but generally by ourselves or, yeah. or somewhere where there's not that many people. So how did it feel um, transitioning onto TV? I love it. I love the attention, to be honest. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> you know, like I said, in the Masson episode, you make a comment and then it gets like set to a piano score with a rising crescendo. Yeah. So <laughs> for me, for, for a person like me, who's a bit of a... Uh, an extroverted attention seeker, it's fab. <laughs> I, I, I think the, the one thing that I find strange to get used to is being asked to do the same, to kind of sometimes you, you, you because you're trying to create a good scene that will look good on television, you, you sometimes have to, um, um, you might have two or maybe sometimes three takes of something. Um, that can be, that, but that's interesting. That's all part of the process and, um, I think the other thing, the, the, not probably for an archaeologist, the number one thing is trying to remember that things that you think are uninteresting actually might look quite interesting on television. So um, the, the TV production team are always saying, always let us know when you're doing something because we might want to film it. And sometimes you think, oh, well, I'm just going to lift these finds because they're they're just normal because there's stuff I, I, that's what I do all the time. And the, the TV production team at, at Strawberry Blonde, they're always saying, oh, but like make sure there's someone there to, because they mightn't use the footage, but actually they, they can turn sometimes what seems quite mundane into quite an important narrative and, and things that the viewers might be interested in, in seeing because they, they don't see it every day. So yeah, that was good. And conversely, a lot of the stuff we think is interesting, apparently yeah. is not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the best example of that was at Lenton, that um, the students' garden trench, um, where we were all like, this is what a fabulous section. Look at yeah. all that. Look at the stratigraphy. And we ended up calling it a connoisseur's trench. Yeah. Because the TV <laughs> crew were just like, it's mud, guys. It's different coloured mud, what you're talking about. We're like, can you not see how fabulous that stratigraphy is? Like, oh, no. yeah, there, were, there were like two or three buried soil horizons in there, it weren't there? Brilliant. It was lovely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was a lovely trench, that. <laughs> the way that that particular shade of brown then, then intersected with the next shade of brown down, they just, I don't know why they couldn't see. How <laughs> I've got that as a poster on my wall now, that brown <laughs> interface you just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I thought it was quite nice because you do get a bit jaded, like um, Don said, with the uh, things that just you see every day, like willow pattern or even even medieval pottery. And I know in my 
uh, runty puppy trench at Lenton, I had a large amount of what were probably Victorian um, animal bone. Pro you know, it would just be where people have been chucking them in their backyard or, and you were just sort of hawking these things out and putting them in the fine tree. And then every member of the TV crew who came by would be fascinated by it. And you, then you kind of thought, yeah, I suppose we do become a bit, you know mm. numb to the things that we see all the time and forget that everything's quite fascinating when you're not used to it so it was quite nice I think to sometimes be shaken out of your um archaeological um curmudgeonly ways and <laughs> and go actually I suppose that is exciting yeah that is quite exciting well you didn't get some classic medieval pot in there though, yeah classic, 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 medieval. Classic, medieval. classic medieval yeah it was the most classic <laughs> medieval pot i think i've ever seen <laughs> sorry chloe <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we had a, a great comment here from Real Dad. Fantastic show. My kids love it. I was amazed how quickly you were able to identify your finds and how the knowledge just poured out. So there oh. you go, with your classic medieval. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I wonder how many people you converted into liking glass and to finding it interesting. I do wonder, oh. so actually, yeah. how many people found, how many of you watching this right now found, find glass interesting after seeing Chloe talk about it? To be honest, I, I didn't find it interesting before, and I was like, this is really interesting, actually. <laughs> glass, is, glass is really interesting. It yeah. really, really is. Um, yeah, you just have to give me, just give me a show where I just talk about glass, and I'll convert yeah. it on. Yeah. <laughs> what would you call that? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, shattered. Yeah. <laughs> it's just you in a, in a bar, and you're just uh, talking. About <laughs> yes. At the end of the night, just leaning on the table, I'll tell you about glass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. smashing. You've got to go with smashing. Yeah, thing. yeah. Yes, yeah. Isn't glass smashing with Chloe Duck? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> Disclaimer: there Please do not smash the glass. <laughs> <laughs> the glass is hard to make. Yes, it's smashing. Please do not smash the glass. That is a cameo from my son who's in the movie. <laughs> I didn't know you were a ventriloquist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, and last things, actually, before we head off, because it has been an hour and 45 minutes, always fun when I'm speaking with you guys. Time does fly by. Is there anything any of you'd like to add regarding this episode or even other episodes previously? Anything? Hmm. Hmm, Don. Hmm. To be honest, I can't remember now um, in Benwell what they showed in regards to environmental archaeology, but I enjoyed uh, watching the process and like even filming you myself. And That's you were just there washing it all out, washing out the soil, yeah. sampling. You did it all. I don't know if it made the edit though. I no, I, I think we the, the remains from, from Benwell were um, not particularly, they were very, very typical of the what could be called the background noise of a of a Roman site. So, um, um, because that that area had been there'd been so much movement of material um, on any Roman site, you just get it's very normal to get very low amounts of charred cereal grains, very low amounts of charcoal. Um, it, it, Benwell was interesting for me because in my in my kind of normal day to day work, um, I've been looking at some some really massive excavations that have taken place near that area. Um, when there's been housing developments. Um, so it is quite interesting to see the, the remains surviving beneath the, the 1930s housing, but um, uh, on um, land plots nearby, there've been some other very interesting Roman sites revealed um, um, through, through development. So I think that was, that was for me, what I found Benwell most interesting because it, seeing it compare to diff different sites that were quite nearby. Brilliant. And um, Claire or Ellie, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Um, I don't know. Like, um, I think it's been great to be part of that episode. Sorry if you hear this background noise, probably the puppy going. Anyway, no, I, I really enjoyed um, digging there and being with everyone that was, you know, kind of in the back scenes and like, yeah. Does it make sense when I said anyway? I loved it. It was it was, it was nice. great. It was um, great. 
yeah it was it, it was nice it's nice to do for a change because um it's it, it's something totally different when you know it, you work in commercial or field archaeology and I think one of the things that was nice about it was that the, the time scales are sort of dictated by the archaeology for all we're making a tv show and that's the reason that we're there you don't have that commercial pressure of yeah. this has to be finished by Friday and you know you've just got to kind of crack on with that you could you could pace things appropriately and so invariably oh, you know so the plan went you'd be digging interesting nice archaeology liaising with communities and and getting that kind of feedback and you weren't always sort of under the the time pressures that you sometimes are and then you also got the fascinating insight into how you made you know a television show and everything that went with that so and you got to hang out with people who you know you became good colleagues with <laughs> who's that Claire <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> colleagues that you would miss <laughs> no I, I don't follow sorry what's... <laughs> I'm saying that we arrived as strangers and left as colleagues <laughs> colleagues <laughs> I've, I've come to think of you as someone I once worked with <laughs> <laughs> I don't seem to have your number in my phone uh, remind me <laughs> I have to go I have to go <laughs> <laughs> Um, and by the way, for anyone tuning in, and if you are interested in learning more about glass, please check out Chloe's uh, Archaeoduck channel, which the link is actually in the description below. So you can learn all about glass and maybe I think... Oh, Ellie, also, um, I'm on TikTok and a video I did on TikTok about the Lycurgus Cup, which is a really interesting piece of Roman glass, has yes. had close to 400,000 views. So that's just proof of how really? cool glass is. Yep. Who'd have thought it? Piece of Roman glass. So there you go. Um, I think TikTok's algorithms are crazy, but yeah, I'm also doing stuff on there. That's smashing, Chloe. <laughs> Yo, I've never heard these glass puns before. <laughs> <laughs> what you're doing here is so transparent. <laughs> She's blown away. <laughs> now I've got nothing. No. <laughs> I literally am like, I can't think of anything else now. Just gotta, you've got to be sharp when you're trying to think of puns, I think is important. <laughs> Can I say, actually, you were talking about working with different people. We haven't talked much about the production crew in, the, in these live streams. Um, and I seriously doubt any of them will be watching it, to be honest, because they've got like, you know, they're not the people that oh, are kind yeah. of super interested in archaeology. But um, I think they are geeks, like we're geeks, right? And they're geeks, but they're geeks in a slightly different way. So I always found that really interesting. Like these two, like, you know, the kind of very techy people that do all the sound stuff and the video stuff, yeah. total geeks for their stuff. We're total geeks for ours. Yeah. And then we kind of meet in the middle over a shared love of outdoor gear. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just a really weird group of people to bring together. Um, I definitely, but, yeah. I definitely think that um, the most interested that they ever seemed in anything I had to say was when I told them the barber outlet was in South Shields yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that you could get big discounts. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, oh, actually. As I said, as I, yeah, Barbara is cool. I think they did actually go there, by the way. I don't know if you know did that. Did they? Some of them did go to the South Shield outlet, yeah, because they didn't bring jackets with them. I remember oh. that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But, um, Several heads turned definitely turned sharply when I said, "You know, the barber factories in South Shields." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say actually, one of the directors, Nick, Nick Friend, um, his grandfather was an archaeologist, so oh. it was actually great speaking with him. So he direct he was uh, one of the directors on um, episode one. Is it episode one? Yeah, yeah, it was Matt and well. Nick. Benwell, yeah, it was uh, Benwell and then uh, this episode, um, so episode four at Massim. So it was actually quite interesting to, to speak with him and see how he was interpreting what we were doing. Because I felt like sometimes he kind of had like two hats on. Like I mm. think he was kind of that middleman in, in a sense where he was able to get when, you know, we want to be left alone or we were digging something, we just need to work out what was going on. He was able to understand that, I think, as well, and then help portray it. And he'd always also ask us these questions and and ask us again and again. And we didn't we didn't maybe appreciate him as much at the time. But when you look back, you're like, actually, I get what he was doing now. Yeah. <laughs> and isn't it isn't it fun all the stuff we've learned? Come on, everyone, give me some noddies now. Just a few noddies. Yeah. 
No, oh, oh. oh, no. So this is the these are these are the TV terms that you pick up when you work with them. So you know you've got someone chatting, they're telling you something, but you know that the camera's on them, and then they actually want to catch you listening. So sometimes they want to just film you just nodding along. Yeah so that we can get that. I don't want to totally burst the bubble and drag down the fourth wall, but there are all these interesting little things that you pick up, aren't there? I was um, quite glad that when they asked me if they could film some nodding, they just filmed Tash doing some nodding so that I had a heads up of what they meant. And I was able to do some really convincingly subtle nodding, like... <laughs> <laughs> and then I think one of... <laughs> One of my best TV interactions, Tash, was when they then said, right, and Claire, we'll, we'll just film you saying bye to Tash. <laughs> yeah. And then set it up and I went, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and all of them laughed. <laughs> the whole film crew were just like... <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I've nailed that. <laughs> One shot. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> well, would have to say, though, I feel like we are professional nodders now. And, uh, yeah, it's the skill. Yeah, okay, except for Claire. Um, <laughs> not everybody can do it, because sometimes when someone's doing it, it, it can help if you talk to them. Um, but I'd have a habit, then people would go, oh, yeah, oh, and then talk, talk back a lot of the time. It is, it, it's actually really hard to just nod and smile. Um, <laughs> and walking and talking people struggle with as well, by the way. I don't know we ever had to do that though we were just always actually maybe Jim were you walking and talking or were you I can't uh remember. no not at the same time which is a good thing <laughs> that would have been a challenge yeah I got I, I had to stop moving and then start talking one take though I was really <laughs> really pleased <laughs> don't worry we'll do a hashtag more Jim next year uh, next year <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I think we should wrap it up because it's been shy of two hours. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you all as always. Yeah. Um, we will be having a um, kind of a, a live stream piggy banking off um, individuals that were in the show, um, which we will be releasing shortly once I uh, ask everybody involved. Chloe knows what I'm talking about. Hopefully, I'm going to speak in riddles now. But um, we do have another um, um, another live stream in the works that's kind of loosely based on the Great British Dig, or how we all connected with each other. But um, it's more about careers. So keep your eyes open for that one. Hit that subscribe button so you get notified. And again, as always, have a lovely evening, a lovely day, whenever you watch this. And um, hopefully there'll be some more information regarding the archaeology that was found from the show. Uh, later on in the year that we will make accessible and we'll post it everywhere so hopefully you get to to see that as well so thank you so much everybody for joining and see you soon bye bye, bye. thank you for Noddies. Noddies. goodbye Noddies. YouTube. Noddies, yeah. bye <laughs>